So as we wrap up the commandments, God's tender commandments today, let's recognize that what God does is God rescues us, and God calls us not to covet, and he's got a much better plan for our lives. Let's use these words on our screen. Because God rescued you and called you his, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house, or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. And we should fear and love God, so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty so that Jesus' character is displayed to us and to the world. The other day, I was visiting a couple of seniors who are homebound. They're unable uh, to come to worship with us, so I was taking Holy Communion to celebrate with them. And as we were talking, I asked one of my favorite questions. I asked, What's your favorite Bible verse? I hope all of you have a favorite Bible verse. And maybe if you don't yet, uh, you'll gain one today and make it your favorite. Now, usually when I ask that question, one of the frequently mentioned responses is John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When I ask, middle school students that question, I sometimes receive a different response of John eleven thirty five, 35. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. So when I asked this couple that question, they both answered Psalm 23. Not one verse, but the whole chapter, Psalm 23. Now, you might remember how Psalm 23, verse 1, how it begins. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or you could translate, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I don't need anything else. Right? You don't need anything else. You don't need that new iPhone 15. You don't need that Kate Spade purse. You don't need those uh, Nike Air Jordan 1 shoes. And I don't need that specialized S-Works SL7 road bike with the Shimano Digital Integrated Shifters. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But wouldn't it be nice And so we hear God's words. Don't want. Don't covet. Now what does it mean in these ninth and 10th commandments not to covet? Covet is a seldom used word in our vocabulary these days. Coveting is more than just wanting something sometime down the road and, okay, it'd be nice if I had it. Coveting is different than that. Coveting is this passionate craving. In fact, one of the words that's used for covet in the New Testament is a Greek word, epithumia. The word epithumia is also translated lust. So that what coveting does is that coveting drives you, and that coveting you lust for something or some experience, you crave it, is wanting something so badly, it's always on your mind, you make it the center part of your day and of your life. It dominates you because you know that whatever, when you have whatever it is, it's going to bring you what you want. Happiness and satisfaction. Covening. Now, sometimes we covet certain things because we use those things that other people might have to compare to what we have. And we're constantly in this comparison game. And so we compare with other people our jobs, 
our houses, our cars, our income. We compare our clothing. We compare our looks to what our neighbor has. And it's really not that I want the things that my neighbor has for himself, but I want the same stuff my neighbor has for myself and probably a little bit more than my neighbor has. And so our self-worth is determined by our net worth. And our security comes from acquiring what we're coveting. And so that whatever it is that you want, whatever it is that you covet, it's dominating your life. It's controlling your life. So in other words, to covet something means to make it your God. Yeah, it's not a small thing. This is big. To covet something means to make it your God. And that's what Paul was talking about in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, he says it. Well, in Colossians 3, verse 5, Paul repeats that same con conversation. He says, put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. So that coveting is much more, oh, you know, I just want that for myself. It's much deeper than craving things. What coveting does is that coveting is something that originates in your heart and it reveals the motives and the desires of your heart. So whatever it is that's driving you, whatever it is that is controlling your behavior, that's coveting. And what you crave the most is what your heart is most attracted to and fixed upon. Your covet. And without it, you are discontented. Again, what's that called? It's more than covenanting. It is idolatry. And maybe you've noticed this now, that as we wrap up this series on God's tender commandments, that these last two commandments about covenanting are very similar to the first commandment. And these last two commandments are about idolatry. Remember the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What's it about? It's about idolatry. And these commandments are about much, something much bigger than your behavior, what you do or what you don't do. The commandments are, at, are about concerning about what's at the very center of your life. You see, our God is compassionate and generous. Our God is loving and tender. And what our God wants for us is to realize that God alone, that He alone is enough. That when you have him, you have all that you need. Remember that first verse from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. So that when you have God, you have all that you need. It's not that things are bad, not at all. Lots of things that I love. I, I love desserts. I love the Chicago Cubs, you know that. I love my wife, and I love God. And they're all good, and they're all deserving of love, right? Well, maybe three out of four are for you, okay? <laughs> but they are not all equally important. And it's not that the good thing is a bad thing, but that the good thing becomes your God thing. Do you see that? The good thing has become your ultimate thing. That's why St. Augustine, an influential leader and thinker in the early church, third and fourth centuries, there's this famous statement by St. Augustine about sin. He said, the essence of sin is disordered love. Stay with that. The essence of sin is disordered love. So coveting is this inordinate desire, this out-of-order love of the heart. Disordered love means that we love less important things more than we should. And we love more important things less than we should. And that wrong prioritization, that, that disorder, it results in unhappiness and confusion and chaos in our lives. We will be dissatisfied because we are disordered. So here's what you got to think about. What is disordered in your life? Where are you taking good things and making the most important things? And where are you loving most important things less 
then you should. If your investments, your income, your career, your relationships, your relaxation, your hobbies, whatever it is that is uh, first, that is ultimate for you, your heart's out of order. And we find ourselves putting things above people and everything before God. But God wants you to experience something different. God wants you to experience that your self-image comes from Him and that you will find happiness and security in God Himself, that God is enough. Psalm 23, verse 1. Maybe it becomes your favorite Bible verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Which calls us then to trust God. That God alone is enough. Trust Him for that. You see, you don't belong to your stuff. You belong to God. Your identity does not come from what you have or what you don't have. Your identity comes from God. God has purchased you and God has made you His. Now, Ten Commandments are in two places in Scripture. In Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 in the Old Testament. The chapter before Exodus 20, Exodus chapter 19. you got to catch this. One of my favorite Bible verses. God speaks these incredible words. Exodus 19. Out of all the peoples, you will be my treasured possession. This is God's ordered love. That you, think about you right here, right now. You are his prized, precious, priceless passion and possession. You. That is God's rightly ordered love. As you hear confirmants share their statement of faith, that faith began, for most of them, in the waters of baptism. And what was God doing? God was putting a sign of ownership upon that child or upon that adult. For all of you, God puts a sign of ownership on you, and you're marked as a sign of the cross, and you're marked as the one redeemed by Christ the crucified. So you are not owned by your stuff. You are owned by Christ himself who redeemed you. You belong to God. God alone is enough. And God is the one who changes you. Hope you discover this as we've gone through the Ten Commandments. That saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to give it my best, or I'm going to change the way I'm thinking, that doesn't really change how you live. It doesn't change your orientation. What you need is more than just trying to change your behaviors on your own, more willpower. What you really need is a new heart. The law doesn't change your heart. Rules don't change your heart. God changes your heart. God reorders your love as he changes your heart. And God gives you a new heart. There's this passage in the Old Testament. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36. Powerful words from God. Here's his promise to you. I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Catch this. He puts us, gives us a new heart, puts the spirit in us. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Your life changes when God gives you a new heart. So that instead of coveting, when you have that new heart... God gives you something entirely different. God gives you contentment. Contentment comes not from your latest acquisition or your accomplishment. Contentment comes from what you already have right now in Jesus Christ. So we heard from Meredith those words from Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. So St. Paul speaks and he says, I learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, when you would look at Paul's life, you would think that Paul had every reason in the world not to be content. 
he had a serious physical ailment. He had been imprisoned. In fact, he was in kind of a prison as he was writing the start of Philippians. He had experienced hunger and hardship and difficulty and shipwreck and beatings and ridicule and the subject of gossip, all sorts of things. And yet Paul was not cut of coveting different circumstances. He wasn't coveting what he didn't have. He celebrated instead the new life that he already had in Jesus Christ. God was enough for Paul. And that's why earlier in the letter to the Philippian church, he says, for me to live is Christ. Not my stuff, not having something else. For me to live is Christ. Let's go back and look at those words from Philippians 4. It could be your favorite Bible verse where Paul wrote, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. A caveat for you. Paul is not talking about running a race, acing a test, completing a project, scoring a goal, or even putting up with some annoying person. So you can rip and throw away that t-shirt that you're probably wearing from the last time you ran a marathon. It's not about that at all. Paul's talking about contentment, about being content during adversity, being content during conflict, being content during challenge. And God gives you contentment. Contentment does not come through, from, through education or accomplishment or finances. It comes through him who strengthens me, through Jesus. Contentment is not determined by your possessions. It's not determined by your circumstances. Instead, it's determined by what God has done in your life. You see, you have contentment when God has you and you have God. That's contentment, that God is enough. And maybe right now you're looking at your life and saying, you know, my life is not going the way I thought it was going to go. You're grieving a loss. You're struggling with some, through some adversity. And you're cha- covering some change in circumstances, different experiences. But God has what you need right now. You have what you need when you have God. So Paul then, he he wraps up this section with a powerful verse, verse number 19. It could become your favorite Bible verse. And God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God had met all of Paul's needs as this Philippian church provided once and again an offering to support Paul whether he was in Thessalonica or now in, uh, in a prison, with his ministry. And now Paul is writing to them, to this church, that God was going to meet all of their needs. They had sacrificed, and instead of coveting what they had just given away, they were going to have all their needs met in Jesus Christ. God provides for you as a church, and God provides for you as an individual. He knows you, he loves you, and he knows all that you need. He provides. God's warehouse is bigger than all of the Amazon warehouses put together. Think about what he has for you. It's overflowing with everything that you need. He delivers his presence for you when you're lonely. He brings forgiveness for every sin, healing for every hurt. He has daily bread for your daily needs. His supply never is exhausted. So instead of coveting, We continue to pursue God. Paul wrote a young pastor named Timothy. And I think about Timothy, probably like a lot of young families, had lots of challenges. You know, the time challenges, maybe financial challenges becoming established in life. And Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Pursue God. Or there's this promise in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. And the context is, will I have enough money? And the author of the Hebrews wrote, be content with what you have. Because never will I leave you or forsake you. 
We're content. Because Christ is by our side and he is with us no matter the circumstance. That changes how we live. Contentment is demonstrated in how we live. Contentment results in an explosion of generosity. Here is this church. They were content. And they sacrificed once and again, brought together this huge offering for Paul to expand ministry. And when you read about the first church, whether it's in the book of Acts or in other writings, those first Christians, they started living with less. They sold their property. They gave to anyone as he had need. They took strangers into their homes and they fed them. They sent money to the poor. They supported those who were carrying the message of Jesus to new places. That's the result of contentment. There's an explosion of generosity. This is the joy and the freedom that comes when we experience what God has already given us in Christ. They were confident God would provide. And they were generous. We are confident God will provide. And it leads to generosity. You have what you need when you have God and God has you. These two commandments. Don't covet your neighbors. So instead of coveting what our neighbor has, we give for what our neighbor needs. Instead of wishing that we were like our neighbor, we want to be God's expression of love to our neighbor. And we sacrifice for our neighbor. We sacrifice for the mission because we want everybody to experience the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's all because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In Jesus' name, amen.